Good morning and welcome to today's webinar, A Lean Approach to Public Policy. If this is your first webinar with us, I'd like to take just a brief moment to introduce who we are. Uh, Equi8, we're a relatively new organization, a consulting firm based in Alberta, Canada, focused on solving social and health problems with a particular interest in the health gradient. My name is Steve Peterson and I'm the founder and managing partner of Equi8 and I'll be your webinar host this morning. We host free webinars this month and every month for those working to solve health and social problems as a service to help us all be more effective in the work we do. Relevant to today's webinar, my background in public policy includes working in the nonprofit sector, doing policy advocacy, working in a provincial health system focused on healthy public policy, and developing and teaching a university course on healthy public policy. I'm excited that you join us for our webinar today. The webinar will follow the following format. First, introducing the concept and benefits associated with a lean approach. Second, describing the application of lean to public policy development. Third, reviewing a case study of lean public policy development. And fourth, introducing a framework for applying lean to public policy. Before we jump into lean, let's spend a few minutes on public policy so we're all on the same page. Public policy, it's an absolutely huge topic. For the purposes of today, we're going to focus on some very specific aspects of public policy and public policy development. Public policy has many definitions and descriptions. If you studied it and read textbooks and reports on the topic, uh, there are many definitions out there. The simplest, and for me the best one that I've heard, is that public policy is a means of solving what is perceived as a public problem. And it's about both what governments do and what they don't do. But it's important because often we think of public policy advocacy as asking governments to do something. But just as often it can be asking them not to do something or being aware that they've chosen not to do something as a response to a public problem. Many of what are considered public problems are also social problems. Social problems are perhaps a smaller subset of public problems. Examples include poverty, hunger, education, and health care. For these public problems, public policy is therefore a legitimate and necessary strategy for addressing them. Now the process for developing public policy has been described in a variety of models. The process generally consists of a number of sequential steps such as identifying an issue or problem, developing a public policy to address it, advocating for the adoption of the policy, by a level of government, it could be provincial, federal, municipal, or school board, any level, implementation of the policy, and evaluation of the effectiveness of the public policy. Lean public policy zeroes in on the public policy development part of this process. Now, I've heard the development of public policy likened to a game of snakes and ladders, prone to unexpected gains and unforeseen setbacks. A good example of this is the policy for AISH, H stands for Assured Income for the Severely Handicapped in Alberta. I know of someone who's worked on this issue for a good 20 odd years, trying to get the rates increased. Suddenly one day a newly elected government announced a $400 a month increase. The 20 years were a process of ebbs and flows, or snakes and ladders, until at last this policy advocacy objective was realized. Equiate, we've developed a lean approach to public policy with the hope of introducing a ladder into this particular game of snakes and ladders that will help move the public policy development process more efficiently and effectively towards policy advocacy and implementation. So what is lean? I drive today a little Toyota. It's very fuel efficient and quite a good little car. I used to drive an older Ford. So what happened? Well, a hailstorm. Biggest baseballs, you can see them in the picture there. It caused tons of damage and also made cars in the area quite affordable. So now I drive a Toyota. The point is that Toyota is a symbol of quality, a good car. Lean is part of what made it so. Lean originated in manufacturing and became famous with Toyota. It was part of what made Toyota the leading car manufacturer it is today. In a nutshell, Lean seeks to eliminate any waste or the use of any resource that doesn't contribute to the value received by the customer or end user. Eliminating waste in manufacturing lowers the cost of production and increases the efficiency of processes, creating a better product 
quicker. In the context of public policy, this definition gives us something to consider. Where is the value in public policy? Who is the customer for public policy? And where is the waste in the public policy and development process? Let's start with the idea of value. And to discuss value, we turn to our definition of public policy as a strategy to help address a public problem. Given this definition, the value of a public policy lies in its ability to affect the public problem. Sounds simple. But remember, the process from problem to policy solution is fraught with snakes and ladders. What about customers? Who is the customer for public policy? Is it a stakeholder advocating for a public policy? Is it a government who has the ability to create a public policy? Or is it the people affected by the public problem that public policy is intended to solve? At various stages of the policy development process, the customer can be all three. But ultimately, both the advocate and the government would view public policy and its ability to positively impact the people affected by the public problem. To summarize so far, the value in public policy lies in its ability to affect the public problem. And the customer for public policy ultimately is the people affected by the public problem. What about waste? The third principle mentioned in this definition. Let's first consider waste in the context of the business sector and entrepreneurship. The conventional approach to starting a business begins with writing a business plan. This includes substantial research to identify your market and customers, describe and develop your product or service, project your financial cash flow and income, and other elements essential to business success. The problem with most business planning is that it is full of assumptions that prove questionable once the business owner or entrepreneur completes the planning process and begins working to implement the business plan. In other words, it is wasted effort. Is there a better way, a more efficient and effective way of starting a business? The answer is yes. Lean has been applied to business and entrepreneurship. It doesn't rely on business planning as the key to business development. Instead, it has as its fundamentals two principles. One, getting out of the building quickly. And two, the idea of a minimally viable product. Rather than conducting extensive research with data and surveys, Lean requires getting out of the building quickly to test the viability of a product or service with actual customers partners and suppliers before investing substantial amounts of time in developing an idea only to find that there is no market for it. You remember the dot-com era? Examples of this abound. One, one that comes to mind is Pets.com. Back in the early 2000s, Pets.com was developed to sell pet food to pet owners. And the pet industry is highly lucrative. Pet owners are passionate people willing to spend money on their pets. It seemed like a good business model. One thing that, um, one assumption that proved questionable was the shipping. Pet food can be heavy. Shipping costs can be expensive. This, this led to the breakdown of their model and the eventual bankruptcy of their business. The, key, the second piece is the minimally viable product. This is the key to the whole lean process. A minimally viable product is a product in its simplest form, flaws and all, which can communicate an idea well enough to enable one to gauge support and feedback for it. A great example is the website Dropbox. If you're not familiar with Dropbox, it's a file synchronization service that stores files and makes them accessible across devices and has grown to a multi-million dollar operation. If you're familiar with websites, businesses, a website would require lines and lines and lines of code funding pitches to venture capitalists, beta testing and other phases of development, a lot of work before it ever launched to find out if the business model worked. With Dropbox, rather than go through the process of writing lots and lots of code and pitching the venture capitalists on the idea to fund its growth to a stage where it could be tested and released, and then hope customers actually came, Dropbox built a minimally viable product their minimally viable product consisted of a three-minute video, no coding required, that explained their idea and gave them the ability to gauge interest and demand for their service before investing in its development. By doing this, they reduced the potential for wasted effort. 
So how is waste created in the process of public policy and development? The development of public policy positions or advocacy strategies includes a stage of work focused on assessing possible policy alternatives. We can call this a search phase. Usually this includes a literature review and environmental scan which identify what is known about the effectiveness of various policy options and lessons from their application and implementation. In some cases, it can take many months to get through a literature review and environmental scan to identify and develop preferred policy options, only to find when working to advocate or implement them that they are not supported, desirable or feasible options for the various public policy stakeholders. This sounds like waste. So can we create a more efficient and effective way of developing public policy options? Paralleling, paralleling the process of lean entrepreneurship, reducing waste would require getting out of the building quickly with a minimally viable policy model in order to gauge support for it prior to its development. We've seen that a minimally viable product can be as simple as a descriptive video. It doesn't even need to be in the same functional category as the actual product. By that I mean a slimmed down or alternative version of the same product, as its purpose is only communication, not operation. So what does a minimally viable policy model look like? A minimally viable policy model could be anything that communicates how a public policy addresses a public problem with enough detail to generate a reaction that permits gauging the level of support for it. At its simplest, it would start with the public problem. If there is no agreement or motivation that a problem is in fact a public problem that a government needs to deal with, there would naturally be no support for a public policy to address it. If there is support for a problem as a public problem that a society and government needs to be involved in addressing, then the next step would be to describe the preferred policy solution and gauge support for it from its customers, advocates, policy decision makers and analysts, and those affected by the problem. A minimally viable policy model is not a literature review or an environmental scan. It needs simply to be a way of communicating the message of how a public policy can address a public problem. This may make people uncomfortable, just as business people are uncomfortable with the idea of taking a minimally viable product out to show people. A minimally viable product, remember, is full of flaws and shortcomings. It's not perfect. There may be a tendency to feel that one is on a shaky foundation as the product or model is minimally viable. It's helpful to remember at this stage that the principle that in policy advocacy, if we consider advocacy broadly as seeking support for an idea, evidence does influence policy, but rarely does it drive or initiate policy. This should help create comfort for the idea of a minimally viable policy model as a way of testing a policy's viability before proceeding with the policy development process. Evidence becomes very important later in this process. Once you're engaged with a policymaker or decision maker or advocate, your literature review and other research can be quite helpful then. But done out of order, done without first testing a minimally viable policy model, they run the risk of being wasted. It may be that as you discuss a minimally viable policy model with stakeholders, that they ask questions you don't know the answer to because you haven't done all the research yet. This is okay as another principle of policy advocacy is that the most important piece of evidence is what the policymaker needs to know, not what you know. This presents another opportunity to avoid waste. You can do research more or less on demand as it is needed to answer questions rather than do voluminous amounts of research and run the risk of it being wasted. Waste represent resources that could be more effectively applied to solve your problem. Waste can never be reclaimed, enabling social and health problems to continue longer than they should. Waste is therefore an obstacle to progress. Let's pause and summarize what we've discussed so far. Public policy is a means of solving what is perceived as a public problem and is about both what governments do and what they don't do. Lean seeks to eliminate any waste or the use of any resource that doesn't contribute to the value received by the customer or end user. Lean, applied to business and entrepreneurship, relies not on business planning, but on getting out of the building quickly with a minimally viable product in order to gauge interest and support for the product prior to investing in its development. Lean, applied to public policy development, similarly relies on getting out of the building quickly 
not with a body of research, but with a minimally viable policy model that communicates in some way a public problem and how public policy could address it as a means to be able to engage others, engage support for the public policy. Given this understanding of a lean approach to public policy, let's apply it to a case study. The first step is settling on a problem and establishing that it is a public problem. For this case study, we'll focus on the issue of income inequality. This is a great example of an issue that may or may not be considered a public problem depending on one's perspective, understanding, and ideology. Public support that inequality is a growing problem that needs to be addressed as illustrated through a growing public consciousness of rising inequality and its adverse effects show that it is more likely and likely increasingly possible to get support for inequality as a public problem whose root causes lie in public policy decisions as opposed to being a private problem whose root causes lie in individual disadvantage. Sir Michael Marmot used the example once of a subway ride through Washington, D.C., and how life expectancy varied by 20 years from the beginning of the trip to its conclusion to emphasize the public and social context for inequality. A quote from his description, quote, board the metro train underground in southeast Washington, D.C., and head up toward leafy Montgomery County, Maryland. With each mile you travel, life expectancy increases about a year and a half. The average suburbanite near the Shady Grove Station will have 20 years longer than the typical city dweller around Capitol Heights. She will also outlast her counterparts in DuPont Circle and Chinatown, and along the way she'll enjoy better health, less stress, and more autonomy. The part of this description that always catches my attention is the note that for each mile you travel on the subway, life expectancy increases about a year and a half. A great analogy for the gradient concept and a great description of inequality as an issue that has a social and community context as opposed to an individual as opposed to it being an individual problem. The level of support for inequality as a public problem may vary from place to place. This assessment does not require exhaustive research. Conversations with key individuals would be sufficient. The second step is communicating how public policy can address this public problem through the creation of a minimally viable policy model. Inequality has its roots in early childhood. In this case study, we develop a minimally viable policy model that shows how investing in early childhood development can reduce inequalities in childhood that often persist into adulthood. For our model, we'll utilize a brief whiteboard animation video that tells a story. Just give me a moment while I bring the video up. So this simple, brief, one-minute video illustrates the proposed public policy solution in the context of addressing the public problem in sufficient detail to enable gathering a reaction from policy stakeholders. The third step is gauging support for public policy as a means of addressing the public problem from various stakeholders, from the advocates, decision makers, and those affected by the issue. In this case study, this would consist of simply showing the video and having conversations with various stakeholders to get their reaction to its message and to the proposed public policy solution to the problem of inequality, income inequality. <laughs> 
final step would be to take the minimally viable policy model, if it has proven itself viable in the initial consultation and conversations, and return to the conventional policy development process and begin the process of assembling the research and nurturing the relationships necessary for its implementation. Alternatively, if the minimally viable policy model was not supported, one could repeat this process for the same public problem and design a different policy model to address it and see whether there was support for it. This could be repeated until an acceptable policy model is arrived at. Key to this case study is that waste is minimized through the testing of minimally viable policy models rather than fully developed policy positions. The key to the test is to see if it has value with its customers, various stakeholders involved with and affected by the public problem. Building on the principles of Lean and the case study of its application to public policy we described, Equiate has developed a framework to guide the application of Lean to public policy. First step is identifying a public problem. Not every problem or issue is a public problem. The definition of public policy we reviewed earlier is that it's what governments do and what they don't do. Often governments consider possible courses of action and elect not to take them for various reasons. If this is the case in your situation, then your problem is not considered a public problem. It's also important to consider what type of policy is the appropriate solution. Legislation is not always a long-term fix, unless it's keeping you from doing what you want to do. Often it's possible to operate instead within policies, orders and council, or other types of policy. Now, if your problem is not perceived as a public problem, you could choose to shift your focus to trying to create policy space for your issue. This would involve its own communication strategy and be a different advocacy strategy. When your issue is perceived as a public problem, then you have the first necessary foundational step in place. The second step is building relationships with stakeholders. Now, when you intend to get involved with the public problem, it's very important to focus early on developing and strengthening your relationships with its stakeholders. Often the default tendency, especially for those of us like myself with a public health background, is to jump into the research and build an evidence base. While this is useful and helpful and necessary, it is arguably more important to the success of a public policy initiative to develop relationships with key stakeholders than it is to summarize evidence. So instead of jumping into the literature databases, it would be better to jump out of the building and go meet with like-minded people. This is because most successful public policy efforts are not the result of an individual organization's efforts, but the result of many people pushing in the same direction. So building this coalition early is helpful, and in the context of Lean, creates an informed audience to discuss your policy model with. Third step is developing a minimally viable policy model. Remember, a minimally viable policy model is a communication tool that seeks to open doors with stakeholders and get, garner agreement that pursuing a specific policy solution to a public problem is a good idea. It is not a presentation of evidence. It is simply a presentation of the logic of how a public policy can address a public problem and can take many forms. Whatever format you choose, keep in mind that its core purpose is simply to communicate A, that a problem is a public problem, and B, that your policy solution is a desirable way to address that public problem. The fourth step is to share your model with stakeholders. It can be quite uncomfortable to go public with a minimally viable policy model, as by definition, it is incomplete, flawed, and full of holes. The key is to remember that it is good enough to communicate the key points and elicit a response. The very idea of a minimally viable model may seem disconcerting, just as business people are uncomfortable taking anything but a finished product out to show to people. It reflects for many of us our training in research and analysis, where one is still not always comfortable with, for example, a completed publication, as we know it intimately, including its shortcomings. Likewise, there's a natural tendency to feel one is on a shaky foundation as the product or model in a minimally viable product or model is full of imperfections and flaws. However, this vulnerability can actually have a positive effect. Being transparent and open with people about the imperfections and flaws in the model can build trust and invite input, which can facilitate engagement and dialogue that can better inform the further development of the model and begin to enlist support among stakeholders. Further, it is helpful to remember at this stage the principle we discussed earlier, that in policy advocacy, considered broadly as seeking support for an idea, 
Evidence does influence policy, but rarely does it drive or initiate policy. So at this stage of the policy development process, that's what we're seeking to do, to drive or initiate. This should help create comfort for the idea of presenting a minimally viable policy model as a way of testing a policy's viability before proceeding with the policy development process. Evidence will become important later in this process once you're engaged with the policymaker or decision maker or advocate. But at this stage, you are seeking support for your policy idea. The fifth step is to gain support for your model. It's important to recognize the importance of stakeholder support as a key determinant of policy feasibility. Even the best policy or best evidence will have difficulty overcoming strong opposition or a lack of necessary political or public support. The essence of this stage is engaging in quality conversations or dialogue with stakeholders to get their reaction to your minimally viable policy model. The sixth and last step of the model is to develop your public policy. If all the other steps have been completed successfully, then the minimally viable policy model has proven itself and the development of public policy can proceed with confidence that it will be supported and the effort required not wasted. Working this framework through creates a ladder in the game of snakes and ladders that public policy development sometimes can be, helping public policy development be a more efficient and effective process. This concludes the presentation portion of our webinar for today. We hope you found this intriguing and are looking forward to exploring a lean approach to public policy further. I'd like to now open the webinar up to questions for the, the remaining time we have left. Now, to ask questions, you'll notice at the top of your screen the My Mood icon. If you hover your mouse over it, you'll see it gives you some options to raise your hand or do a thumbs up or thumbs down. If you have a question, please indicate by raising your hand and I'll see it on the screen. And you can either ask your question or type your question into the chat window and we can have a discussion about it. Thank you for your questions today and the interest in this topic. We're at the conclusion of our time for today's webinar. This webinar has been recorded and will be available on our website and our webinar archives shortly. As I mentioned, we, we do have a discussion paper that we will be sharing with webinar participants and posting on our website. We're also offering, um, I'd like to make you aware of our four-hour rule. You may be familiar with Google's 20% rule. This is where they give their engineers the autonomy to focus 20% of their time on their own ideas related to their work. This is where Gmail, Google, Google News, and other good ideas have come from. At Equate, we've adopted a similar practice. We call it our four-hour rule. The idea is that every week we set aside at least four hours in which to focus on talking with others about their issues that they're working on as a means of offering an opportunity for reflection and dialogue for those working in the field. At present, we've committed to dedicating these four hours to follow up from our webinars. So what that means is if you found a lean approach to public policy interesting, and would like to explore its possible application further, we're available for free consultations through our four-hour rule to explore this with you. My email is there on the screen. Simply send me an email and we can go ahead and schedule a phone call. We would also appreciate your feedback on today's webinar. We'll be sending you a brief evaluation survey as soon as the webinar is completed. If you take the time to complete it, it would be greatly appreciated as it helps us to ensure our webinars are helpful and relevant to those working in the field. Thank you again for your participation today. We look forward to future conversations with you about a lean approach to public policy and to possibly seeing you in our other webinars we'll be hosting this month and in future months. Again, my name is Steve Peterson with Equiate, and thank you again for your participation today.